Jan, could you please unmute yourself? There. And Jen, I see that you have unmuted yourself. Um, with that final detail, <clears throat> I'm going to turn it to you, Jan. Very good. Are we all set to move forward? And okay. Good afternoon. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Estes Park, I welcome you and to our program on election security, recent past, and looking forward. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters here in Estes Park, and we're so happy to have so many members of the general public and uh, other leagues possibly from around the group, uh, state joining us for this important program. And also we're especially honored to have as our guest speakers, Colorado Secretary of State, Jenna Griswold, who we claim as one of our own in Estes Park, Larimer County Clerk, Angela Mars. And <clears throat> we will learn about the methods that these important ladies have put in place to safeguard our voter security and to make sure that Colorado is at the forefront of being able to provide safe and secure elections. So now I'll turn the program over to our, our league um, director of voter service, Robin Converse. Thank you, Jan. It's wonderful to have you all with us. I'd like to remind everyone of the mission and vision of the League of Women Voters that serve as our guiding principles. In order to be shared with others later, this meeting is being recorded. All microphones are muted except for speakers. The Estes Park League solicited questions from Colorado League members several weeks ago, which we have shared with our speakers. They will address many of these questions and I will be asking more of the questions following their remarks. If you're able, we suggest you choose speaker view on your Zoom window. I'm very honored to introduce our award-winning Colorado Secretary of State, Jenna Griswold. Secretary Griswold considers herself a passionate defender of access to elections. She just led one of the largest democracy reform packages in the nation, increasing access to voter registration polling locations, and mail-in ballot drop boxes across Colorado, including on tribal lands and public universities. She increased transparency of money in politics and lobbying. Secretary Griswold has been a champion for ensuring all Coloradans' voices are heard and is committed to restoring faith in government. Secretary Griswold grew up in Estes Park, so we'd like to proudly welcome you home, Secretary Griswold, and welcome to this League of Women Voters program. You have the floor. Well, thank you so much, Dan and Robin. It's so nice to be welcomed home, even from afar. Um, I did make it up to Estes. Uh, it wasn't last weekend because last weekend was um, us escaping Snowmageddon. Uh, but the weekend before, and it was so nice to walk through town. Um, we got some taffy from the taffy shop. Um, and I won't tell you how much of that I ate, um, but it's always great to see everybody. So thank you for having me. Um, my, oh, my 2020 was a doozy for so many reasons. Um, you know, on the personal front, if you, not, if you all know my mom, Reva uh, from Estes Park, uh, she was exclusively taking care of COVID patients at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and I know so many of us has, have been touched by COVID-19 um, and so was our work. Uh, you know, we ended up running two statewide elections during the pandemic and one right before uh, Colorado started to adjust uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, we started the year with our first presidential primary in 20 years and the first presidential primary ever uh, in which unaffiliated voters could participate. Uh, and our elections were a huge success, but that actually started in 2019. 
Uh, when we worked with the league uh, and I was able to lead and, and get passed with the legislature, the largest democracy reform in the nation. Uh, and that included campaign finance reform, lobbyist reform, parolee reenfranchisement, automatic voter registration, uh, and the beginning of increasing access to all voters through expanded drop boxes and voting centers, and also guaranteeing that access on public universities and tribal lands. And why I say that our success for 2020 started in 2019 is the groundwork of increasing access was tremendously important as we went into the pandemic. Uh, to take us back about a year ago, um, literally a, a year ago last Friday, I closed down the office and we went to a predominantly remote work setting. Uh, and we started to see across the nation uh, primaries facing trouble with COVID. So for example, we saw Wisconsin, where in Milwaukee alone, 180 voting centers were reduced to five. That led to hours and hours of long lines and unfortunately people contracting COVID at the polls. Then we fast forwarded and we saw Georgia, uh, where those images of predominantly African-American voters standing in 12 hour long lines in the rain and the wind uh, were spread across the nation. And I knew we had to act. We had to act to make sure that every eligible Coloradan, whether they're Republican, Democrat or unaffiliated, could have their voice heard in a safe, secure and accessible election, even with the pandemic. So here in Colorado, we increased access even more. Uh, so in the past two years of me serving as Secretary of State, we increased drop boxes by 55%. So when we saw the governor of Texas, for example, restrict one drop box per county, we have one drop box per every uh, 9,000 people or so in Colorado. Uh, we started to roll out health and safety measures like sending PPE to all the counties and establishing sick pay for election judges. We recruited thousands of election judges, by the way, to make sure that our voting centers wouldn't close like we saw in Wisconsin. Uh, we partnered with the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe and the Southern Ute Tribe on Native American access. We expanded the ability to track a ballot statewide through ballot tracks, increasing transparency, and we made it easier to fix signature discrepancies with programs like Text to Cure, uh, which over 11,000 Coloradans used to make sure that their voice was heard in the general. Uh, and we led the nation in countering foreign disinformation. Um, and I'm really proud, and we all should be really proud of our success. We had record turnout in our general election. More Coloradans voted than any election before in state history during the pandemic. Uh, we also saw massive increases in voting with some communities that have been historically disenfranchised. Uh, for example, on tribal lands, we saw about a 20% increase in voting, uh, in voter participation in just two years. Uh, so overall, we were, act we were able to do that proactive work uh, and partner with community groups across Colorado, including the league, to make sure that regardless of the pandemic, regardless of those forest fires. And I know how scary it was in Estes. My mom had to evacuate two times uh, with the Cameron Peak and, and the East Troublesome. Uh, and even with all the disinformation coming from the highest positions of the United States government, we had a great election. Um, another thing I was really passionate about in 2020 was doing our part to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Uh, I saw my mom, or I guess I, I didn't see her, I was not there, heard her. Uh, get up, drive that hour to get to work and take care of COVID patients exclusively at the beginning of the pandemic. And it was scary. And one of the things that we have as a tool for elections and stopping the spread of COVID-19 is mail ballots because mail ballots are, are like wearing a mask. That's how we have our voices heard, uh, but we don't, we can social distance and, and we uh, 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 prevent the spread of COVID. Uh, so you all know that Colorado is a national leader when it comes to elections. Uh, and election security in a large part because of our election model, which includes vote by mail for all, same day voter registration, early uh, access to voting, online voter registration. Uh, so I basically said, hey, we have the tools to support the nation, let's help out. I started working with other secretaries across the nation. Our elections division was sharing best tips and practices to support the nation in expanding vote by mail. And according to the Washington Post, we expanded access to mail ballots in 2020 to over 83% of American voters. 
Uh, so in the face of a pandemic, the nation really leaned in. Not only did we have record turnout in Colorado, we saw record turnout across the nation, both among registered Republicans and registered Democrats. Uh, with that, uh, you know, we had a great election, but our fight for voting rights is not over. Uh, we are seeing a tsunami of voter suppressive bills right now. Over 250 bills have been entered in uh, state legislatures in 43 states coast to coast. Uh, and I believe that if you're eligible to vote, you should have the access to do so. And that voters should, should choose their elected officials and not elected officials choose their voters through voter suppression and gerrymandering. Uh, so our, our work is not over. And I just look forward to continuing to work with the league. They have been just, uh, y'all have been great partners uh, in all of our legislative pushes and everything we're doing in the office. And I was really happy uh, to award uh, the Colorado League of Women Voters a NAS Medallion Award, which is a national award uh, for just the outstanding advocacy for voting rights uh, and the things that you do to make sure that all Coloradans know their rights and can have their voices heard. Um, so thank you for everything, for the Colorado League, from everybody in Estes Park. Jan, it's lovely to see you. Um, it's so nice to see good friends and I, I hope to see you all uh, fingers crossed um, in person in the summer and in the fall as COVID-19 uh, vaccinations ramp up and we get back to our, our new normalcy. Um, so thank you all. And with that, I'm, I'm happy to turn it back and take any questions. Robin, would you like me to go? I, I have a couple of questions that were sent. Would you like me to start there? Secretary Griswold, um, Robin may have been cut off on her internet, so I'm gonna okay. ask you. Okay. okay. I'm gonna ask you a couple questions. Um, could you Okay, I will start going through questions. Can everybody hear me? Can you do a thumbs up? Okay, perfect. Um, and finally, I can see you guys. Hello, clerk. Hello, clerk Angela Meyer, um, Larimer County clerk, uh, who was on top of making sure that uh, all people in Estes Park and Drake could have their voices heard with the election. Uh, we actually had another clerk um, from, you, you all know, uh, you, you go across the, the, the mountains into Grand Lake. Um, the clerk, Sarah Rosen, on the other side of the divide actually had to have her staff rescue ballots. Um, so I was really happy to award her also with a, a, a NAS award. It's the National Association of Secretary of States Award uh, for just her bravery and fortitude um, in the face of that. So we will start, I have a couple of the questions. I do not have all of the questions. Um, so let me see. So the first question is, let, let me scroll into the document. Um, can you get, so uh, someone asked, can you give us an overview of security measures that our offices implemented um, to make sure that every vote is counted um, and that the process, the ballots go through from um, getting a ballot to when it's returned and verified? Um, so this is a, a huge question. And luckily with our elections, they're really transparent in Colorado. Um, and that transparency was even increased uh, in 2022 with a lot of clerks offering uh, actually a live stream of the processing of ballots, but also through statewide ballot tracks. Um, and that's a program that you can sign up with uh, either uh, through our office or with your county clerk um, to be able to actually get notifications either by email or by text, you can choose, um, of when your ballot is sent in the mail to you uh, and when it's been received and processed by your county clerk. Um, so, you know, the, the first off is that you register to vote. Every registered voter in Colorado gets uh, mailed a ballot. Um, but in Colorado, uh, most, most of the, the voters use the mail ballots. About 96% of voters will choose to use their mail ballots. Uh, the vast majority of voters actually drop those off at a drop box. Um, but of course, you can mail it in as long as you get it in by election day. But we also have the feature of voting in person. Um, and that early voting and election day voting is really important. We had about 200,000 people vote in person using those options this last election. 
Uh, and those are people who may not have received their mail ballot or they just choose to vote in person or even register and then cast a ballot in person. Um, I, I believe, you know, uh, to take a step back, uh, back a couple decades ago, um, those voter registration deadlines were important because we weren't able, we didn't have the technology to track who has voted and who hasn't. And you remember we, there used to be precinct voting. So you would go to you know, your local precinct to cast a ballot. Um, but now it's, it's 2021 and we can actually track in real time as ballots are being received and who is registered and who is not. So that enables us to have same day voter registration. So many people will register during early voting or even on election day and have their voices heard. Um, with our voting system, if you vote in person or you vote your mail ballot, there is a voter verified paper ballot, a piece of paper. And that's one of the reasons that we're considered the most secure state in the nation to cast a ballot. Because even though we know that vulnerabilities to cyber attack exist in anything we do, uh, whether uh, any type of online type of situation, uh, a cyber attack cannot hack a piece of paper. So we're able to have confidence in our elections. Uh, and we, along those lines, my team goes out across the state and does a secure build of all the voting equipment for people who vote in person and choose to vote on a piece of equipment. And we do something afterwards, Colorado was actually the first state to do it, called a risk limiting audit. Uh, where we are doing a, a totally independent audit, all the county clerks do it, um, and we basically verify the tabulation of the ballot to the actual votes cast on the ballot. And that's how we know to a statistical degree of certainty uh, that the election results are correct. Uh, Colorado is considered the securest state in which to cast a ballot, not just by me, your Democratic Secretary of State, uh, but also, for example, by Kristen Nielsen, who was uh, President Trump's former Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security and also the Washington Post. Uh, because we do things like risk limiting audits. And for the election support system, such as our statewide voter registration system or online voter registration, uh, we are at the forefront of technology, making sure that we're doing absolutely everything we can to protect systems. Um, but uh, apart from that, you can't hack a paper ballot. Uh, and we really right now need to go back to the basics as a nation to make sure our elections are as secure as possible. Another question, um, and anybody please interrupt if you wanna do this a little different. I just have a, a couple questions that were sent over. Um, so one of the questions is, what is the Secretary of State's office doing to secure our elections from foreign interference? And what are the biggest threats we have seen as well as what are the biggest threats we expect in the future? Um, and that is a, a big question of our day um, because we saw starting in 2016, uh, a mass uptick in foreign interference from countries like Russia and China, uh, and to some extent Iran, and those continued uh, through the 2020 election. Um, election inter infrastructure is always scanned uh, on a daily basis. So we have thousands of, of individuals or governments or uh, entities every day scanning our systems and seeing if any of the doors are open to try to get in. So the first line of defense is always uh, investing a lot in our uh, cybersecurity. Again, you can't hack the actual election, but there are support systems like uh, the results you see that are posted on the website or online voter registration, which we want to protect. So the first line uh, of defense is making sure that we continually lead the nation in cybersecurity, and we do. Uh, we, are, uh, we, we just received an award uh, again um, in a bipartisan award from the former U.S. Attorney for the state of Colorado, who was an appointee by President Trump for our efforts to protect the 2020 election. Uh, so we should have a lot of confidence in, in the work that we're doing. Um, but another part of it is not only trying to, to get into support systems, it's actually a new wave of voter suppression. And that new wave of voter suppression is through misinformation by putting so much false information out there uh, that we trick voters, not we, uh, that adversaries, I should say, try to trick voters uh, about either candidates or the electoral process. Uh, we saw a massive amount of foreign disinformation from Russia in 2016 uh, that continued into 2020. We also saw it for Iran, from Iran 
Uh, for example, um, a national intelligence came out uh, and actually alerted American voters about Iran uh, trying to tell voters in Florida that they couldn't vote. Um, and this is a, a really big problem. And by the way, the problem of foreign disinformation isn't only with elections, uh, it's with any topic that can be divisive. So for example, right now we're seeing a massive amount of foreign disinformation about COVID-19 because these are how foreign adversaries try to divide us. Uh, so there are several things that we can do. And again, I, I'm really happy to report to all of you that we are at the forefront of the nation um, I actually set up a unit within my office last year. Uh, it's called Rescue. And the whole point of the unit is to help combat foreign disinformation uh, and alert Coloradans of the threat. So what that unit does, and by the way, we got the number one premier person in the nation to run it. Uh, so the former acting Ass assistant secretary um, uh, for counterterrorism for, from the Department of Homeland Security runs this unit for the state of Colorado. Uh, yeah, so it was really great. It, it took me a while to, to get him out here, but we're really happy. Um, and what we did in 2020 is now being uh, replicated across the nation. Other states are asking us how to set up the same system. Uh, so there's a couple things we did. Number one, we actively monitored foreign disinformation. We have great relationships with the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI and other intelligence to, uh, share to share intelligence, but we wanted to monitor it ourselves also. Uh, and the, the ability to monitor it means that if we see something about the electoral process being pushed out uh, from a foreign adversary, we can really quickly uh, respond. So that means, so for example, say there's a bunch of tweets saying um, Colorado's voting equipment is, um, uh, no good. And this has happened in the past. If that really gets picked up, then we can push out over social media in a boosted way, true information. Um, I also uh, formed a committee, which luckily we, we did not have to use, of former Republican secretaries of state uh, to stand up with me in a bipartisan way if there was a lot of foreign disinformation that went to the electoral process. Uh, and we actually also ran an initiative, and I think it was a great initiative where we were boosting out content, alerting Colorado voters of the threat. The number one thing we can do to counter foreign disinformation is make people aware about foreign disinformation. You all know, I know you all have friends uh, who believe what they read in Facebook, who believe what they see uh, on just some websites that are not verified. This is happening across the country and I, I know it happens in Estes Park too, being from Estes Park. So what we need to do is make sure that our neighbors know, our friends, our family members know that just because you read it on Facebook doesn't mean it's true. And when it comes to the electoral process, you have to go to entities with good information. So that's our office or Clerk Meyer or the League of Women Voters, trusted sources of information. So we pushed out that initiative. Um, it worked tremendously well. Um, and I look forward to continuing to tackle this, this problem. We actually have a piece of legislation uh, potentially this year that we will hope to partner with the league on getting through uh, to continue to tackle foreign disinformation. Thank you, Secretary Griswold. I have, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. And then after that, if you have any closing remarks, go right ahead. Here's the question. What is being done legislatively at the national and state level to implement election best practices expand voting rights, and what is Colorado doing to preserve its vote by mail model, which has set national standards? And lastly, how can League of Women Voters members get involved? Um, well, thank you, Robin. Um, this is uh, a really relevant question because we are seeing um, a lot of foreign disinformation and domestic disinformation um, spreading uh, untruths and uh, just uh, lies about the electoral process. And I truly believe that politicians should not be able to manipulate laws to try to keep power. Um, and when we're talking about voter suppression, that's what we're really talking about. Um, if elected officials or special interests are allowed to kick out of their districts voters they don't like through gerrymandering or voter suppression, or if we drown out the voices of everyday people like all of us and allow special interests to just flood the airwaves and, and the, the rhetoric, the, the conversation, uh, with endless amount of conversation that isn't actually what the people want, 
uh, we end up electing uh, or getting elected officials that don't represent all of our interests, that don't actually uh, represent the people. Um, and that's what we're seeing. Uh, on the heels of the last election, um, the rhetoric it is really dangerous. It led to an insurrection. It's led to threats and violence to election officials across the nation. But it also opened this doorway to the flood of, of uh, voter suppressive bills we're seeing. Uh, state, uh, coast to coast, this is uh, one of the, the worst voter suppressive uh, eras that we've seen in recent history. Uh, so number one, we all have to demand that everyday people like all of you and me get to choose our elected leaders. And that means having a democracy that works. And we know in Colorado, because our mail-in mail ballot system was set up, uh, it was passed in a bipartisan way. It was set up by a Republican Secretary of State. And we know that it doesn't help one party or over another. It helps voters. Uh, and we have the proof and, and, and evidence of what type of registered voters use mail ballots. It's, it's voters from both parties. So the first thing we have to do is push the truth and not allow disinformation to sway our politics. Uh, in Colorado, there has been five bills that would have, uh, that are, are part of this big lie of spreading uh, uh, lies to try to suppress voters. It, and it's basically some very select politicians um, trying to keep their power. And, and that's just not how this country should work. Uh, so there's five bills in Colorado. We've already killed one. One of them would have um, undone the, the idea or the, the system where we send a mail ballot to every registered voter, would have cut early voting. It would have forced uh, clerks uh, to throw out ballots that weren't counted on election day, uh, by election night, excuse me. Um, and it was just uh, not good. So we're working to prevent those bills. I'm fully, uh, uh, I, I fully believe that we can do that. But the, the, the bigger thing is that we have a democracy in Colorado that, that people should be really proud of. But your right to vote shouldn't be dependent on your zip code. These are your constitutional rights. They, they shouldn't change if you have to happen to go over a state line. They shouldn't change because of the, of the color of your skin. And that's why I'm so passionate about seeing the For the People Act pass. That's HR1. Uh, and that's the, the big piece of legislation in Congress that protects voting rights, that makes sure that all Americans have access to a mail ballot just like us, uh, that makes sure that there's early voting, same day voter registration, automatic voter registration. Uh, and it starts to fight the corruption uh, across the nation like we have in Colorado. So it, it exemplifies uh, or it, it, it includes the 2019 piece of legislation I ran with the League of Women Voter Support to combat corruption through uh, political spending. It has lobbyist reform, it has ethics reform, it has anti-gerrymandering. Um, and I think how the League can help uh, in members of the League is just demand a democracy that works. Voters should choose who runs this country. Voters should choose who their mayors are, who their statewide elected officials are, who the president is. And those elected officials should listen to voters' concerns. Um, and I'm just so happy to, to partner with the league. It's so nice to see everybody. Um, I, I see my old teacher, Mr. Martin, on the line. Nice to see you, Mr. Martin. Um, I hope to see you all in person. And I would just say in closing, um, that it's, I won't say that the last two, the last year was easy for any of us, including my office. Um, but I, I think we should all uh, be really happy with how much election officials love the state because they were having the same types of hardships that many of us had, whether it was having family members laid off, uh, worried about COVID, having people sick, uh, just the hardship of staying at home, but they worked, the, the folks in our elections division and our IT division, worked around the clock for a year to ensure that our elections were successful. Um, and I've just been so happy to be Secretary of State during this time to make sure that we're standing up for our state and standing up for our democracy. Um, and I always love uh, to see everybody from Estes Park um, uh, because you guys know, um, I, I don't, I'm not the, the typical type of statewide official. I don't come from money. Um, I vividly remember going to the Larimer County Food Bank uh, up there uh, near the Ark when it used to be up there. Uh, and just, um, I, I take those values to statewide office and, and try to do the best I can to represent all of our voices. Um, so I just really appreciate it and look forward to continuing to work with the League, of course, but also hopefully seeing you all uh, in person, um, hopefully over the summer or in the fall as we get COVID under control up in Estes Park.
Well, thank you, Secretary Griswold, for sharing your knowledge and inspiring work that your office performs for the state and for your kind words about Estes Park. Um, we do have some questions on chat. And, and okay. so, uh, well, what I'm going to say is that I, you will have access to those questions and folks can also send questions to you via your website. So okay. um, we wanna respect your time and we were so glad you could make it to, to, to join us today and thank you and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you all very soon. It's great to see friendly faces and old friends and um, you're in good uh, hands with Larimer County Clerk, Angela Meyer. So have a good day. Good to see you, Madam day. Secretary. Good nice to see you. See you all later. Take care. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce Larimer County Clerk and Recorder, Angela Myers. Clerk Myers is committed to the citizens of Larimer County by delivering accurate and timely services, ensuring the integrity of secure and verifiable elections. Let us now hear from Clerk Myers. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to be here. I appreciate so much the uh, league making these kinds of forms available to um, the general public. And um, this is what it's all about, a chance to talk directly to the horse's mouth, uh, so to speak, about the questions that you have. Um, and I so appreciate it. Um, and it was nice to see Madam Secretary on as well this morning. So I want this to be an interactive process. That's the way I operate. If you've ever heard me speak, I want to I want to talk about what you care about. So I'm going to let you throw a question or two at me. Okay. Um, as county clerk and recorder, what can be done to make our elections in Larimer County more secure and to allow yeah. citizens to have trust in the election process? Well, you know, I think uh, what you're doing here with these kind of forums goes a long way. I think folks being informed is so critical. You know, when the secretary spoke about um, some of the biggest threats that we have, uh, some of the biggest threats are misinformation and folks intentionally trying to misinform. And uh, there's a real easy way to combat that. Go directly to your source for your information. Um, I work for you. Every elected official works for you. And that's where you should get your information. You've got to be very, very discerning about the internet, about um, Facebook, Twitter, uh, because bad actors who don't even live in your community and aren't anywhere um, near you are influencing those places. And also, even the if the message is correct, it gets misinterpreted or misexplained um, a lot of times. So it's so important to go straight to the horse's mouth. Also, um, participate in the process. The worst thing you can do if you have concerns about the system is to just, ah, not going to participate. Because that just perpetuates something that if you think it's negative, you're only giving that away and, um, and uh, letting that negativity win. Go ask the questions of folks like me. Get the answers you need and participate. Maybe that means simply voting, or maybe it means being an election judge, right? Elections are actually um, conducted by uh, citizens just like you. Uh, it, it isn't my staff. My staff makes sure that the processes are done exactly as the law requires, that we make sure every I is dotted and every T is crossed, that we inform the public as needed to make sure that they can um, access the process appropriately. But the process is actually conducted by citizens in bipartisan teams all across um, the, the, from beginning to end, it's done in bipartisan teams of election judges. And so uh, participate, be one of those judges. Thank you. Okay, what are the greatest threats to election integrity in Larimer County? Well, as I said, you know, I, I think this, I can dovetail from the last question. I don't want to repeat myself, but I think the things I said in the last question um, apply here as well. To take it a step further, um, the, the ballot is least secure when it's in your hands. So it's the responsibility of the voter to treat that ballot with care right? We have bipartisan teams that pick up those ballots, whether it's from the post office box or whether it's from a drop box or whether it's um, from a voting site. 
Uh, we have bipartisan teams, chains of custody uh, happen, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But when the, the ballot is in the hand of the voter, it's critically important that that voter treats that ballot with the security it needs and the care that it deserves and, um, and does not give their ballot to anyone else. Never, ever, ever, ever give your ballot to anyone else. I don't care if they have the best of intentions. I don't give it to a harvester. Don't give it to anybody for any reason. Drop it in a box yourself. There is no reason, as Madam Secretary said a few moments ago, we've got bo drop boxes all across every county now in Colorado, certainly in Larimer County. I'm sorry for the train. Many of those boxes are drive-through boxes. So you don't have to get out of your car. You just drive through and, um, and drop your ballot in. There is no reason to give your ballot to someone else. Certainly never before you vote it. Certainly never after you vote it and before you seal it. Certainly not after you seal it and don't sign it and, and don't even do it after you sign it and give it to someone else. There just is no reason to do that. And I say that because, you know, you may have the most well-meaning folks um, intending to pick those up. <clears throat> I hear from people all the time, oh, I'm gonna help those people in my neighborhood. I'm gonna help those people in my building. I'm gonna deliver those ballots, don't do it. Because those people picking up those ballots also have lives happening, folks. And ballots don't always make it to us. Not because necessarily folks have bad intentions, but because their life is happening. What is the importance of your ballot? If the person who took it from you uh, gets a call from the school and there's kids been expelled, they get in a car accident, they're, um, they just found out from their doctor over the phone they have uh, uh, cancer or their mother has just gone to the emergency room. What's the importance of your ballot? And the one that I've heard, they broke up with their boyfriend. So don't give your ballot to anyone else anytime. And that I think is um, one of the greatest threats to ballot security and, and integrity of the election. <clears throat> You want me to go to the next question or would you? Mark Myers, this is Kathy Long and I'll, I'm will i gonna go ahead with the next question okay. that Robin has here for you. Sure. Uh, so, uh, so the secretary mentioned foreign interference. Has there been foreign interference in Larimer County elections? There, we have no evidence of that, no. Um, I think the secretary explained very well the, um, the securities that they have at the secretary of state level on uh, the um, voter registration system. Remember, our yeah. systems are never connected to the internet when it comes to voting, when it comes to counting those votes. They are connected to the internet when it comes to the voter registration list because by very definition, that is a statewide list that is housed at the secretary of state level. And um, that means it has to be on the internet. But the secretary's office has cybersecurity experts who focus entirely on that system. They do checks and balances routinely. Um, as well, Larimer County, I'm proud to say, has a cybersecurity uh, expert on our staff who watches our system. And um, that gentleman, Tom Iwanski, is a great guy. Um, I am in contact with him pretty regular. Anytime I hear, see anything that might even remotely give me a sense of concern, um, I'm in contact with him and certainly he is watching things as well. So I feel very com confident and comfortable. However, Tom will tell you himself, the bad guys are working 24 seven. So we must be vigilant and there is no perfection. So an, another uh, comment that we've heard since the November election is about voting records becoming manipulated or changed. Um, so, uh, not to repeat, but can you describe any way that that could happen with the mail-in or the Dropbox ballots? It is a great question. So um, I'm glad you asked it. Here's the deal. Um, the, I think the question they're trying to get at, and I'll be glad to work my way backwards, but when we post those election night results, um, I don't post anything until 7.30 because polls close at 7. It takes about 30 minutes to make sure all of our folks are out of all of our sites. We want to be sure that nobody can see any results while they're in a voting site by any chance. And so we, uh, we upload our data from the counting machines that are in our counting facility. Those machines are connected only to the counting server. That server is connected only to those machines. Those machines are only connected to that server. Am I making myself clear? It is a closed loop system. And so um, when we upload the, that data, we put that data on an encrypted um, zip, uh, uh, 
zip drive, right? And um, we have a special computer that that drive goes in. That computer is used only for this purpose to clear that drive off, make sure there's no, no content on that before we put it in the system to pull off that data, okay? We pull off that data and we take it to a totally separate computer and we put it on the internet and we put it at votelarimer.org. Remember, anything you need to know about elections is located at votelarimer.org, okay? And we post it there first. I've had a lot of folks ask me, or a few folks ask me, um, is, is there any chance that it's manipulated? You send it to the secretary's office and it gets manipulated and, and post it. No, because we post it first. And um, then my folks post it to the election night reporting site at the secretary of state's office. It is not a task that we send to them and they do. It's a task that my folks do directly. Okay. And, um, and we know that there's no manipulation there. It would be very obvious if there were. And if you'd like me to work my way backwards, I'm happy to do that as well. But I think that's where that question is focused. Okay, great. So uh, regarding voting integrity overall for the 2020 election, you know, how did Larimer County's election compare with past elections that you've been in charge of? Uh, I got to tell you, uh, and I've said this in years past, this, and, and I, I said, I've said this for the 2016 election. You know, we had elections uh, that have had a lot of noise and a lot of um, activity by folks who perhaps want to act out and whatever. But I got to tell you, 2016 presidential was one of our quietest elections to administer in my memory until 2020. And it was the same way this time. We've got wonderful electors in Larimer County. They act exactly as they should. They don't um, do things they shouldn't do at voting sites or elsewhere. And we had no issues to speak of truly in administration. Our, you know, we have auditing processes that happen after the election. Um, those were as, uh, pro they had no problems to deal with really as they went through it. So this was one of the most um, smoothly administered elections from the administration perspective, right? It was noisy out there, right? And that's the pro that's part of the deal. So we take that in stride. We know that's part of the deal, and and but it did not affect our operations at all. So as far as voter fraud is concerned, uh, were there? Can you give us any actual numbers of fraudulent votes that were cast for Larry? Um, well, you know, I don't see a lot of voter fraud. Um, what we have is people who are confused. And, and I get asked this question all the time. It is a great question. How much fraud do we see? Honestly, I don't see a lot of fraud. There's a onesie twosie factor, right? Um, I can't tell you that I saw a onesie twosie in this election off the top of my head. What we do have happen though, every single election, folks try to vote twice. Mm. <laughs> Anybody fainting on the other end of the phone? No, I think we're here. People try to vote twice. Every election, folks, always have, okay? Um, and is that folks trying to be fraudulent? Honestly, in my experience, it's not. We have 260,000 registered voters in Larimer County right now or so, maybe a little more than that. And what do you think the chances are that a certain even tiny percentage of those folks have uh, interesting lives and things happening in their world that make them not think as clearly as they might on any other given day, right? I have human days when I'm not quite as human as I would wish, <laughs> um, and all of us do. So um, we get folks who try to vote twice. The key word there is try, because our system is set up so they're not successful, and here's why. When you um, return your mail ballot, you have to sign the exterior of that envelope, right? And if you don't sign, first of all, ballot envelope is not going to be open. You're going to get a letter from us that's going to say you got till eight days after election day to cure that envelope, but we're never going to open it. We don't know what's inside. Uh oh, she froze. Okay. Okay. It looks like the clerk's screen has frozen. So we'll just wait a minute and see if she comes right back. Can you hear me? Uh, this well, is Kirsten, I'm her executive assistant. I'm gonna try okay. and get her back because she's actually Kirsten, still talking, hang on. Kirsten, I hear you, but, I, okay. but the secretary's screen is frozen. Yeah, hang on one second. Hang on one second. <sighs> Mm 
Okay, guys, I don't know what happened, but I just got dropped off. Yeah. <laughs> you're, yep, back. you're back. We're Am I talking too long? No, no, no. That wasn't okay. 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 Um, right. Anyway, the minute we get this barcode on here tells us who you are. And it tells the system uh, that we've received your ballot. No matter if you, if you, it's not checking the, the signature <laughs> yet, it's first giving you credit for voting, okay? The first ballot we receive, no matter how we receive it, whether it's voting in person, whether it's received in the mail, whether it's received in a drop box, is the one we're gonna count, okay? The second one we receive from you is the one that's gonna get you a visit from the DA, period. And our system will know that we've already received one ballot for you. And the second one's not gonna count because the system's gonna kick it out, right. okay? So several people in the chat box have expressed uh, appreciation for having the additional drop box added in Estes Park and the fact that they're both drive up, you know, that helped especially during the pandemic. Uh, but another, Dennis has asked this question. Um, all right, since in Colorado, in-person voting is so minimal, what do, you know, what then is the job of thousands of election judges? <laughs> it's a great question. <laughs> It's a great question. Um, and actually, we don't have thousands like we did once. I remember back when we had 1,500 election judges, more election judges than we actually had uh, staff in the county when election time came. So we don't have as many. This last election, about 860 or so we had. That's about the big, that's the biggest election we're going to have, right? Because um, it, our populace grows and every presidential is the biggest one. So um, we still have 860 and that is because we still must man those voting sites. We had 18, 18 voting sites in this last election, um, more than we need in my opinion, but it's, you know, it's available to you. Um, and all of those drop boxes, those drop boxes must be emptied regularly. That requires judges to do so. Those voting sites must be manned with judges who are prepared to handle volume. We invite everyone to the party. And we give everybody the choice. How do you want to vote? You want to vote with your mail ballot or you want, want to come inside and do it in person, right? We give them the choice. And when we give them the choice, we got to be prepared. They'll show up. Right. And so that's why we've got to be prepared at those sites. But when you count this ballot, it is tremendously labor intensive. In the days gone by, when you voted in a voting site, you took your ballot and you put it in a machine as you left in that machine, right? It was counting your ballot, you had already been given credit for voting when you got that ballot in your hand and it was counting your ballot. The job was done, right? And that's why elect election night results were much easier in those days because you got, you know, all we had to do at the end of election night was uh, upload those ballot cards, right? They had to be delivered to our, count our, our counting facility and um, those cards were uploaded. Now, these ballots are all showing up at our counting facility to the tune of 200 and, you know, 20,000 or more. 230, I don't know what the exact number is, okay? And they have to be looked at first. They run through a machine. They, ha they have to be check and balances have to happen before they can even make it to us, right? Then they have to be, make sure it's you on the signature line. Then they have to be opened. Then the content has to be pulled out. Then once that content's pulled out, it has to be flattened, right? And then we have to check and see, oh, is there coffee stain? Is there some extraneous mark on there that might make our machines not read that properly? Those have to be pulled out. Everything we do, remember, is done by a bipartisan team of judges. And that's part of the integrity, an important part, by the way. And then um, once those are flattened, now they're kept, they're counted. I mean, we count all the way through the process. It's much more laborious than I'm explaining, but we put those in boxes. Those boxes are sealed until they can be counted. Then the counting team unseals them under chain of custody. They then uh, count, run them through the counting machine. It is extremely laborious and that takes lots of people. So earlier you mentioned uh, getting results around 7.30 on election day to the probably to Fort Collins. Uh, so, however, isn't there a lag? So when Vicki asked this question, when is your team able to finish processing and counting ballots? You know, I think we finished in this last election. I'm thinking it was Thursday, perhaps, uh, certainly before the end of the week. 
Okay. Um, and we knew it was going to be um, a longer process. However, it was not as long as we thought because the voters uh, made sure they voted early in large numbers. And that is one thing I want to definitely encourage always because that laborious process that I described, if you wait until election day to drop that ballot, we, we are overrun. We get lots of ballots at the last minute and that means election night results are delayed. Um, and we kind of expected it to go even longer than it did, but lots of folks voted early, which was wonderful. We can begin counting uh, 15 days before election day. So we begin processing these ballots. We don't ever upload the results. We don't know what the results are. Please know, we do not know what those results are, but we get up, begin uh, processing these ballots, all those, all those steps that I told you about 15 days in advance. That means that when we make that first uh, posting at 730, that is a very significant posting. It's a lot of ballots because it's everything pretty much that came in early voting. We try to get done before we get to election day so that we, um, so that we can handle the huge glut we're going to get on election day. So um, does that answer your question? Absolutely. So one thing maybe to clarify, you, you've talked quite a bit about election judges and, and you know, the secretary invited people to get involved in that way. So what is the difference between an election watcher and a, I mean, a poll watcher and an election judge? Great question. Great question. Ooh, you got some good ones. Okay. Uh, both are part of the process and both are important parts of the process. Okay. Election judge, and just, that's our name for an election worker. Somebody that we, that works for, for my office, um, they are hired uh, as a temporary to do this job. They work in a bipartisan team, they are paid and they have a very specific, you know, each election judge team has a very specific focus because none of them can be expected to understand everything in that amount of training, right? And so um, those folks actually conduct the election. They're in your voting sites, they're in your county facilities, they're collecting ballots, they are, um, they are doing the checks and balances that come before and after we begin counting, as in our risk limiting audits and our, our um, uh, logic and accuracy testing in advance. They are doing all of those things. And the, uh, the election watcher is exactly that. They, have, they cannot participate in the process. They cannot talk to election judges. They have a person wherever they are that is their contact, and they are watching the process on behalf of whatever political party or um, a candidate. Candidates can have uh, folks, so they don't have to be, you know, they could be an unaffiliated candidate who wants to have a watcher. It can be an issue committee that wants to have a watcher. Um, there are, you know, they can't just have 10 watchers. They can have one watcher in each location um, and that kind of thing. And they're just watching to make sure nothing nefarious is happening. We welcome watchers. And I always say, and I've been saying it for years, every election judge is a watcher, folks. They work with, a, with someone who, who has a differing view than them. And if you've never been an election judge, it is, there is no more a heartwarming thing to see folks realizing that the integrity of the election is a higher calling than their personal political viewpoints. Because if the election is not conducted with integrity, and if they do not take those processes seriously, um, nothing they believe in matters. Because if it has no foundation that is solid, it's, it's bogus. And so uh, election workers are just amazing. Uh, if you've never done it, you should try it. Um, I have yet to have a single election judge and I get a lot of curmudgeons, let me tell you. Somebody calls me and says, I don't believe the process is right. It's got problems, we got issues. I say, come be an election judge. And they do oftentimes and I'm happy they do because it's the best way to see firsthand what happens. And I have yet to have a single one not walk away saying, whoa, this, you can't, you can't mess with this system. It's really good and I'm amazed and uh, it's not what I thought. And wow, these people really work well together. You don't see that in the real world. At least people think they don't see it, right? Well, Clerk Myers, I really wanna thank you for your uh, fielding our questions and giving us really confidence in the integrity of our vote here in Larimer County. Uh, as a kind of final question, is there anything new or different that you see coming up for 2022? Well, I'm sure there is because the legislature is always at work. Um, I, um, I, I encourage everyone to keep their eye on legislation. Please um, 
you know, legislators don't, they're not boots on the ground. They don't understand the, the details of how this works. And um, changes really have impact. And often that impact is on voter understanding, voter confusion. Voters who are confused um, often don't vote. It's true, um, it's true uh, voter disenfranchisement because oftentimes by the time they do understand it's too late. And so, um, pro what, you know, watch the legislation. I know you folks do, but I would encourage, think about um, in maintaining a, a process that is as simple as possible, that most people can understand, that is locally driven because that is security in and of itself. When you have a election that is determined, uh, the processes are determined at the federal level, there's only one place you gotta infiltrate if you're the bad guy. If it's, and if it's mandated at the state level, then there's only 50 places you gotta infiltrate if you're the bad guy. If it's managed and, um, and there is latitude at the local level, you got at least 64 clerks in Colorado alone that you've got to infiltrate in order to be a bad guy and be successful. So I ask everyone, please um, consider those things uh, over and above any political um, interest that might be uh, you know, behind some of those. I also want to say, I work for you. I know there's a lot of questions on this chat that I did not get to answer. And I, I tried to keep up with them as we were going along, but I didn't I didn't watch them as I was speaking. Obviously, that's too much for me to try to do. I would love to see those questions. I would love to have your contact information for those folks. I speak to citizens all the time. It is an important thing for me. And I, I encourage every single citizen to communicate with their elected officials. We work for you. You got to have your voice heard. And I honor the concerns that have been brought this year over the election, I think that a healthy system is one where questions are asked and answered. And, um, and I'm honored to serve. And thank you very much. Thank you, Clerk Myers. In the chat, I've also added your email address and phone number for your office. Thank you so much. Uh, so that could also be used to reach out to you. Again, thank you for your time and all of your presentation today. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Thank you for um, all that you do. Thank you, our pleasure. Uh, thank you to Robin Kaltha and Kathy Long for speaking during our presentation. And I think the enthusiasm of the two uh, person, persons, our two wonderful um, uh, Secretary Griswold and Angela Myers, I think the enthusiasm is definitely catching. And I really hope that as you see on the screen now, we do have uh, different links that you might want to click on. I'm sorry we weren't able to have all of your questions answered, but um, I think both of our speakers are more than willing to hear from you and get back to you. And so for that, we, we certainly thank them so much. And a big thank you to all our attendees, our wonderful speakers, our team, our tech team, led by Kathy Alper and Mary Sampson, and the Voter Service Committee chaired by Robin Converse. And we are uh, having two other programs coming up soon. As you see on the screen, uh, one is April 14th. And on April 26th, we'll be hosting Congressman Joe Nagoose. So all of this information is available on our website. We'd love to have you get more involved with the league if you live here locally. And uh, we really want to say thank you again for attending and happy St. Patrick's Day. Bye-bye.